Hello everyone, I'm here with Joy Marie Mann and Patrick Cote. They are the authors of the upcoming book titled The Yas Queen Chronicles, coverage of the first annual Resistance Forum. And pre-orders are now available. They're here to talk about uh, this amazing new book. Thank you both for coming on the program. Thank you so much for having me back. And yeah, for thanks, having Pat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I'm very excited about this book. I, I think that if you have a Twitter account, and you are in lefty circles, there's about a 95% chance, based on my research, that you have argued with one of the people that they are satir uh, satirizing in this book. Um, so tell us about the book, because we know about uh, Pat's last book. I have it with me. It's called An Inconvenient Douche. Um, absolutely hilarious book. It was a parody of Peter Dow, who has since had a change of heart. Um, so we know that the book's coming out soon. Pre-orders start today, as I mentioned. Uh, what can we expect with this book, Patrick? So we, we wanted this one to be a little um, more, I guess, fun and cathartic in a way than the last one. Um, so this one is that the concept is that there's a panel of um, pundits, uh, media personalities, people we know. Um, Joanne Reed is Joanne Reed. Uh, Nancy Pelosi is, is uh, Nancy Pelosi, obviously. And they're just um, having a resistance forum somewhat and discussing politics. So that was a good setup to bring in all the issues we wanted to talk about. Now, Joy, tell us a little bit more about some of these characters because Patrick kind of touched on some of these names and I already like what I'm seeing. Like, who <laughs> are we going to see in this book? I'm guessing it's gonna be an all-star cast, but tell us a little bit about uh, maybe your favorite character and some others that you think people will find uh, hilarious. Well, well, I mean, we have, you know, we have some special appearances that we're not gonna give away, but my favorite and it seems like my husband's favorite character is Alyssa Shalano. <laughs> um she is very accurately a total mess. Um so she's extremely entertaining. We have Nira Tantrum. Um we have uh James uh Scarville, um Tom Perez, uh Jennifer Poobin, um really all your favorites but then we also have nina burner um because we need someone representing us um who is strong and amazing and can you know stand up to all the shit lives absolutely now i have to ask i don't know if you guys are able to reveal all of this yet but uh pat you're managing the nate's liver account do we do we hear from nate's liver at all Nate is not in this one, but uh, we did we did a, a uh, I don't want to give too much away, but Peter Douche does make an appearance. Okay, okay, that's interesting because I was I was wondering how you handle that character because you know the parody came out and it was very representative at that time, uh, but he's no like he's on our side now, and I think that all of us, even though we were skeptical at first, have kind of embraced Peter Dow. So I'm curious about that. So do, does he does his character evolve in this book? Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, and like you said, he does, he did a, a full 180, you know, in the last few years and you were one of the first people to call that. Uh, and I remember we actually talked about that at one point and I was, you know, you and I agree on almost everything politically. You're one of the few people, but I, I had a hard time seeing his conversion as authentic and I'll give him credit. He's, he's stuck to it. So, um, so anyway, back to 2016 and Peter Dow, um, I just didn't feel like it was right to keep it up, keep the parody going for a guy who's now at least saying the right things for our side. So, so that's why I abandoned it. So, um, he does have a, uh, come to Jesus moment sort of in appear in this book as a, as a good guy. That's awesome. That's awesome. And um, Peter follows he, Nate's liver and me. So <laughs> I think he's kind of like opening up to the, to the sense of, of humor of everything. You know, and one thing about Peter Dow that I love is that he he made a comment that made me laugh out loud. He said something about like 2016 Peter Dow would have blocked 2020 Peter Dow. So it's, you know, it's nice to kind of look back and grow. And I love that, you know, his evolution is reflected uh, because the first book was absolutely hilarious. So just in terms of like satire, I kind of have a sense of like what I'm getting, but I have yet to read the book. So, you know, the general setup is that they're all at this forum 
they're talking. Um, so overall, are there any more details that you can discuss? I know that one of you were going to share a passage from the book as well. So what should we expect from the book? I mean, if you are not like on Twitter, like we are, um, is there still something for you? Because I would argue yes, but like from the author's standpoint, what is your sense of like what to expect if, if um, we're going into this and we haven't read the previous work from you, Patrick? Right. Well, we definitely wrote this uh, not in, you know, we didn't, we didn't want you to have to come from Twitter land to understand this. So, you know, even if, if near a tantrum is near a tandem in real life, hypothetically, um, you don't need to know that. You don't need to know her, her Twitter habits. Um, you know, basically, we're, we're covering electoral politics, the orange man in the White House, uh, trickle down resistance is covered. We've got lots of little themes of, of different segments. That's how we broke the, the book up. Um, where they discuss, you know, just what what's happening in politics, essentially, where the where the Democratic Party is going. OK, uh, OK, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I wanted to ask you guys, because you you wrote a book that's a satire. And, you know, one thing that I heard is that satire during the Trump era is dead because life itself is so strange that it's basically like we're living through a parody. So, Joy, how do you write a satire during a time that is basically literally satirical? Like, how do you make it more absurd than it is? Or do the characters kind of just write themselves? Like, what's your take on this? There is definitely um, a lot of quotes that maybe we don't use quotation marks for. Um, it's very... Uh, it's very... The shit libs are helping us inadvertently write it themselves. I mean, they really are. It's um, one of the the things that we kind of have towed the line with is that Pat and I both find like literally nothing offensive. So it's been difficult to be like, okay, is this too far though? Um, but I mean, you know, making fun of people who are resistors and uh you know the pussy hat people and um the the armchair activists and stuff it really does write itself and i think it's it's been so therapeutic for us and there is not a single burner who will not absolutely identify and crack up yeah i wanted to ask you about bernie sanders actually i mean we're all clearly Bernie Sanders supporters. People who read this book from the perspective of a Bernie Sanders supporter, they're going to get it. Like all the criticisms that we've been railing against for years now, it, you know, you see that in this book. Uh, but Pat, what are the qualifications of the average shit lib in your book? Um, like if you can summarize basically what are the ingredients that make them hate Bernie Sanders? Like what is it specifically from a character standpoint? Why do they hate Bernie Sanders so much? Right. Well, if you're talking about the average citizen, you know, I would say they're they're so susceptible to mainstream media programming. You know, they it's they're almost not at fault at some level, except that, you know, if at this point you don't see that the media isn't telling you the full story on these things, you know, you've got some ownership on that. Um, where I don't think in 2016, it kind of hit a lot of people by shock, by uh, storm shock. I don't know what the right word is, but. A lot of people trusted MSNBC in 2016, and you know every year, us on the left push people, um, the shit libs or whatever you want to call them. You know, part of part of what we try to do is break down that programming that they've been taught that you know Democrats good, Republicans bad, and so your average, um, you know, person that this book is about or or mocking. Um, they're stuck in 2016 thinking still. They don't. They still don't see. They don't see the problems with the Democratic Party. Um, and if they do, they 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 think it's more important to just win regardless of what those problems are. They don't want to discuss those problems. They think discussing those problems hurts our chances. Yeah, and I wanted you to touch on something uh, that I was thinking about in terms of like some of the characters in this near a tantrum. Um, Alyssa Shalano. Now, I don't know who you guys are basing these characters off of. I have no idea. But let's say, you know, they're reading this book 
Is this like is this intended to just be therapeutic for Bernie Sanders supporters, or do you actually think there is the capacity to kind of get these types of people, not necessarily the tantrums of the world, but the followers of the tantrums of the world, to maybe think a little bit more deeply, be more introspective, and think maybe you know my thinking is a little flawed. Maybe it's so ridiculous that it is you know um, a parody. Right. Um, like, is there that potential to change hearts and minds? Do you think for the average reader, like the non, uh, the non person who's like in a position of power but like the msnbc viewer for example right i mean i would say this book on its own has no chance of doing that um but collectively it it adds to the the narrative out there you know when when you read this book and then you see the protest in the streets and the police violence against uh protesters but then you turn on msnbc and you you don't get any of that information uh, so I think all of it adds up and has a, a chance. I think, in a way, satire and parody sort of smack people in the face sometimes. Their cognitive dissonance and their, you know, their groupthink way of thinking, and you know, all their confirmation bias when they when they hear things about progressives. Um, you have a shot when you mock people to get them out of that because they they might laugh at the joke and then the, that gets them thinking, why was that funny? You know, what yeah. was it about that? Um, so there's a chance. But on its own, I mean, the, the the cognitive dissonance is so thick with people that are true shit libs that, you know, we just have to keep at it and then accept that we get uh, five people a week on our side. Yeah, I, I feel like, you know, we've made some strides after 2016. I kind of feel like the left like coalition is broadening because I think that everything that we've been saying has kind of been proven correct, you know, during the COVID-19 era, all of the Black Lives Matter protests. So it's almost like we keep getting vindicated. It's just a matter of people realizing that what we were saying was right all along. Like, it's about Bernie, um, but it's not all about Bernie. Like, he was kind of the spark that ignited this movement. But I mean, I, I think the underpinnings were already there. You know, the, um, the material conditions that led to his rise were already there. Um, but I want to ask you, so this is kind of, I don't know if you guys can answer this. Let's say, hypothetically speaking, we have a resistance shit lib wants to parody the Bernie bros. What do you think your character would be like, uh, Joy? And is there a name that maybe they'd come up with? I'm kind of putting you on the spot. But I've been thinking about this myself, like reading your book. And uh, Joy, you tell, you said something that kind of got me to think about this. Like, oh, well, maybe since I'm, I'm calling them out and writing a parody about them, they're going to do one about us. And I, I was thinking, like, what would my Bernie bro character be? Um, so I'm curious, what is, what is your ultimate Bernie bro character that you would think if they wrote this, uh, that they would name you if they, uh, if they wrote this hypothetical book? Well, I think uh, they would definitely call me a fan uh, because I make jokes about like seeing Bernie 17 times and meeting him like a dozen times and, um, you know, crying when I, you know, uh, watch his speeches and, and things like that. So I'm sure they would say I make him a deity and, uh, you know, I probably have some kind of like crush on him or, or something like that um but i you know i i don't care i can i mean bring it i don't care um <laughs> I, i'm all good with myself you can take it or leave it i i um have no qualms talking about bernie um and criticizing him and i think our last show together um was one of the best shows I've ever done. It was so great to like, you know, delve deep and really talk about, you know, our pain and the way, you know, we're hurting right now that he dropped out and things like that. So if they really want to come at me and make me seem like a fangirl, I, I'll just show them receipts that, you know, I, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, we were very critical of Bernie Sanders, and I've been critical of Bernie Sanders. And, you know, um, I, I think that's kind of proving that this isn't like a cult of personality, because we have the capacity to be critical. You know, um, it, it's it's more than Bernie Sanders, as I stated, you know, the movement uh, was already on the cusp of, I think, emerging, it just needed someone to kind of like help push it in that right direction. Uh, but same question for you, Pat, I'm curious, like, what character would you be in this book if the shit libs wrote one about us? Right. I mean, what I would go for would be that we're never happy. We're, mm. we're purity bros. And um, if we had a list of 10 demands and they gave us nine, we would still be in the streets asking for their heads. Um, and 
you know, there's there's some truth to that, but mostly it's it's hyperbola because it doesn't really apply. It's like we really get one out of ten of the demands, um, and they and they claim in that sense that we're we're still asking for too much. It's unreasonable. Um, yeah, but really, we're not even asking for all ten. We're asking for them to fight for all ten because at the end of the day, we're still going to have to negotiate with the Republicans. But most of the time, we're coming to the table um, with nothing hard left to to uh, to barter with. We're not, you know, we're not we're not negotiating from a position of strength. So, mm -hmm. um, so they would mock us for that for sure. Yeah, uh, I wanted to ask you guys logistically because you guys the audience might not know this, haven't actually met each other in person, to my knowledge, right? And so you live on, uh, you know, different sides of the country, and you wrote a book together. How did that work out? Like, in terms of, like, coordination? Are you guys in constant contact? Do you kind of just, like, write a chapter, and then you, like, compare notes? How does that work? Because I, like, can barely write a book myself. Like, I'm, one, just too lazy. But, like, writing with a second person, that kind of adds, you know, um, another factor in the complexity of writing a book, you know? So... How do you how do you do this with two people across the country? It's been you know it's had its challenges, but it, it's kind of crazy because I asked Pat to do the book because I I was just so disgusted with all the Tara Reid treatment you know and stuff like that, and I just hit him up and I said, look, I know we live like I'm in Pennsylvania, he's in. California and it's I know you're working on another book but let's do something together and he's like okay let's talk this weekend and it just kind of works out so the internet has been amazing um email conference calls things like that and we've gotten our stride for a while we were like all right chapter one and you write chapter two um but then we just got to the point where we were kind of finishing each other's sentences and kind of, you know, combining um, our statements into paragraphs and things like that. And it's it's almost like we got in each other's head, which is kind of creepy, um, having never met. Um, but yeah, it's worked out really, really well. I think like we've we've written equal amounts in the book and it's just kind of flowed if we have you know questions or any kind of qualms with anything we just highlight it and then when we talk on the phone and say hey i'm not sure about this why don't we say it like so and so um so you know yay for uh conference calls and email <laughs> yeah i'll add that because of the the structure of the book being a panel forum and not primarily plot driven we didn't have to coordinate so much of that stuff that you normally would if you were writing a book. So, you know, if we had a, a, a chapter, for example, on um, trickle down resistance, we would plug in there the concepts we wanted to hit. And then we would just start filling in the, the narrative with the dialogue with who says what to who. And so, you know, Joy might chime in. Alyssa Schlano says, oh, something about her poodle in her purse, you know, in, a, in one section, <laughs> for example. But so it. That part of it was easy, and then the editing part, we would just go through together, line by line, and uh, tweak and change, and and it's really been been easy. And with with the uh, lockdown, we're both stuck at home, so it's been a great use of our time, really. Yeah, I, I was curious about that because I've seen your guys' streams together, and like it seems like in terms of sense of humor, you guys are definitely compatible. So I know that like the humor will be consistent; like you won't be you know yanked back and forth in terms of narrative depending on the chapter but you know it still is a lot of work like it's a tremendous amount of work that you guys did in a couple of months which i think is just insane and i give you guys so much credit for that um but here's the thing i haven't read the book yet um so i am going into this relatively blind i know it's a panel possibly a play one day who knows um but can we get a passage from the book i know you guys said um it's possible so can we get a little bit of a, a a demo if you will of the book yes um and and don't be coy we sent you the first chapter and you gave us a quote that's true for the i back did of our book and that's it is true. on our website so um yeah shout out to like ron placone graham elwood uh mike and and all the amazing people who who we sent a chapter to who gave us a quote it was incredible um but yeah so here's just you know it's kind of uh it was difficult to pick just one you know little passage out but um, 
Nancy Pagosi, before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the movement in the streets and the challenging years so many Democrats have endured. Please join me for 2016 seconds of silence as we take a knee together in a show of solidarity. James Garville, is this a bad joke, Nance? Are we really doing the Black Lives Matter thing straight out of the gate? Nancy Pagosi, don't be silly, James. This is an exercise to mourn Hillary's stolen 2016 presidency. It was her turn again. We were still with her in 2016, and now we're still withering. Alyssa Shilano, oh my God, I brought the perfect hat for this. All colors matter. Alyssa Shilano reaches in her bag and pulls out a pussy hat adorned with kente cloth. Nina Burner, put that down. Have you lost your damn mind? Nancy Pagosi, would you just stop it already with the purity test, Nina? No one's perfect. Let's begin. Nancy begins to lean over, wobbles, and then stops abruptly. Soledad lion. Everything okay, Nancy? Nancy Pagosi, actually, Soledad, I think in the spirit of independent women, and partially in the spirit of the wonderful martini I had backstage, we should probably have people perform the moment of silence when they get home. Alyssa Shilano, oh my God, I'll put on my resistance playlist and light my Cuomo sexual candle. So perfect. Joanne Greed, excellent. Let's get this party started with a quick look back at happier times. <laughs> That's good stuff. Good stuff. Okay. Okay. And I will say that j just based on my prelim pre preliminary reading of the first chapter, I would so far rate it a 10 out of 10. So we'll see. We'll see. Um, okay. So tell us what we can do. Um, you mentioned pre-orders. We'll have links down in the description box. When does the book come out, Pat? Um, so we, we put up pre-orders starting um, on the 30th and then the uh, book should be shipping in August. Um, exact date, we're not sure because we have to get it back from our, our uh, book provider. But uh, if you go to savageandpat.com, that's where you can get the book. Um, I did want to make sure and, and do a shout out for the guy that did our cover. He's a fantastic uh, illustrationist. He does comics and political cartoons, Danny Hellman. Um, he's on Twitter at uh, just Danny Hellman Hellman. And uh, he was great to work with on it. Fantastic guy. He did some illustrations for the inside of the book as well. That's exciting. I look forward to that. So once again, the title of the book is The Yas Queen Chronicles, coverage of the first annual Resistance Forum by Joy Marie Mann and Patrick Cote. Pre-order it today. Thank you all so much. Um, I'm definitely looking forward to it. If, if there's anything that's going to be cathartic um, after what we dealt with throughout this year, um, I think it's going to be this book. So everyone check that out and tell them that I sent you uh, when you pre-order it. You could support the Humanist Report at patreon.com slash humanist report. But trust me, I'd have way more supporters on Patreon if that was my podcast. Sad. <laughs>